Hi there guys, what we're going to be looking at today is a little bit of data representation, how we can do some little map bits of maths around computer science. There's an exam question for you, all based around secondary storage. I hope you have some fun with it. Once you've answered it, let's get underway. So first we're going to be looking at our units of data and how they get measured inside a inside a computer. So first thing we need to be aware of is a bit is either a one or a zero. So remember that computers use binary, they use on and off signals, that's why it's a one or a zero. So without those ones or zeros, the computer doesn't know if anything is turned on or turned off, if there's going to be an electric, any electrical current or anything stored, so that's where we need to use a bit. A bit is one or zero. A nibble is four bits. So for example, one, zero, zero, one is an example of a nibble. 1, 1, 0, 0 is an example of a nibble. 0, 0, 0, 0 is an example of a nibble. A byte is 8 bits. So we can go 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, oh, oh. Here we have got 8 bits. We've got 8 zeros and 1s. This is where things get a little bit confusing in one respect, but a little bit more helpful in another respect. Kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, petabytes, terabytes, and petabytes have got a relationship where there's either 1,000 or 1,024, depending on your school of thought, depending on your theories. The exam boards will accept both. So if we say 1,000 kilobytes is equal to 1 megabyte, or 1,024 kilobytes is equal to 1 megabyte, both of those are fine. We can either use 1000 or 1024. Certainly, if you've got any math questions, so for example, how many um, kilobytes are there in three megabytes? I personally would prefer to use thousands as whole numbers rather than working out the thousands and then three times 24 to work out where we're going to go for. They've always got the relationship where 1000 of, of the higher value, so if we're going to go for megabytes, equals sorry if I just run that out again, 1000 megabytes equals 1 gigabyte. If we have a look at terabytes, we've got 1000 terabytes equals, yep, you've guessed it, 1 petabyte. So if we've got 1000 of them, it equals the next one below it. So if you've got 1000 kilobytes, it equals a thousand, uh, 1 megabyte. If we've got 1000 megabytes, it's a gigabyte, 1000 gigabytes is 1 terabyte, and so on and so forth. So as soon as we've caught, gone past that stage there, and we've got a kilobyte, which is 1000 bytes, everything is then worth 1000 onwards from there. So first thing that you need to do is what are the different sizes of units, get that in your book, the sizes, and then how many are needed for the next size. So how many megabytes in a gigabyte, gigabytes in a terabyte, terabytes in a petabyte. Have a quick pause for the video, and then we're going to crack on. So what we're going to look at now is some number conversion and specifically how to convert from denary to hex and from hex to denary. And we're going to do it via binary because it's a good way to show your workings and this is something which constantly comes up on exams. So to begin with, we are going to be converting from denary to hex. So remember with denary covers everything from 0 to 9 and we then use hundreds of thousands of cents in units, whereas hex goes from 0 to f. So what I tend to do and tell to my students if we see a question like this, the first thing you do is write down A, B, C, D, E, F, A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, D is 13, E is 14, F is 15. So remember, hexadecimal, hex, a decimal is 16. So you've got 16 numbers to play with instead of denary, which is base 10, which has only got 10 numbers. So I've got the number um, 57. And I've in denary and I want to convert that to hex. The first thing I need to do is convert this into a binary number. So I'm going to draw out my binary table. 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. And I'm going to convert 57 into a binary number. So do I need the 128? No, I don't. Do I need 64? No, I don't. I will need 32, so I'm going to put a 1 underneath it. 32 plus 16 gives me 40, 48, so I'm going to want to use that. 48 plus 8 will give me 56, so I want to use that. I don't need the 4, 
I don't need the 2, but I do need the 1. So we can see, fif so 57 in binary is 00111001. What I'm then going to do is draw an imaginary line, and I'm going to draw out the number again. But instead of it being one 8-bit number, I am going to create two 4-bit numbers. Because remember, hexadecimal gives us up to 16, and using 8-bit, the largest number we can create is 16. And I'm just going to put the values into exactly the same place as they are here. And then all I need to do is work, work this out. 2, 1, that gives us 3. 8 plus 1 is 9. So denary 57 is equal to 39 in hex. Remember in your exam to make it perfectly clear what the final answer is. Because I've seen some students just leave it like this. It can be too vague for the examiner to understand. So always make sure and highlight what the answer is. Always make sure to show your workings out. So then if for some reason you've not put them together correctly down there or you've made some sort of booby around here, they can at least see, okay, then they've taken the number, they've then split it into two nibbles and try to get the answer from that way so you can, get, try, you can try and get some sort of working out marks. If we have a look at it the other way around from hexadecimal to denary, again, what I would t say to students to do is 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, A, B, C, D, E, F. So then we know exactly what's going to go on. So what I'm going to, I want to do is get the hex number F5 into denary. So again, it's the complete other way around to what we did before. So I'm going to start off first of all doing two 4-bit numbers. And in this one here, I'm going to have my F. In this column over here, I'm going to have my 5. So F is 15. So I'm just going to go 1, 1, 1, 1. And 5 is 1. What, sorry, zero, sorry about that, zero, one, zero, one. So I've got my two four-bit numbers, and then, one, two, eight, 64, 32, 16, eight, four, two, one. I'm just gonna drop the same numbers down into exactly the same positions. Apologies, they're not lined up properly. So one, two, eight, 64, 32, 16, and then these four over here, O one, O one. This is where you now need to do a little bit more maths than you did do previously. But one easy way that I find to do and work with binary numbers and adding them together, we can see 128. We've got that 8 there. We've got that 2 there. I can add those two together quite easily. So 128 plus 32 gives me 0, 1. And we've got 6 there, 160. So that's those two sorted out. I'm then going to add 64 and 16 together and again you might know these off the top of your head but it's just showing out we're showing your workings out to make sure the examiner can see what's going on so we can get rid of that 64 and that 16 and then we can add that 5 on as well so then we need to do 160 plus 80 plus 5 gives us 5 14 so 245 so we can say that f5 equals 245 and remember to draw attention to this as well just so the examiner can see what's going on and remember to show you full workings out as well so what I want you to do in your books now is convert from binary decimal to binary and binary to decimal which is the first stage that we looked at in both sets of conversions and then convert from decimal to hexadecimal hexadecimal to decimal as well so Give it a quick pause, and then as you probably see by me being a little bit too trigger happy with the mouse, we're going to look onto number addition and shifts as well. So give the video a quick pause, and then we'll get cracking. So as you've seen uh, previously, what we're going to be looking at now is number addition and shifts, and also overflow errors. So we're going to do some maths, but the first thing that you need to remember is these nice, easy, little, simple rules. Zero plus a zero gives you, strangely enough, a zero. 1 plus 0 equals 0, 0 plus, nope, sorry, that's wrong, 0 plus 1, of course, is 1, 0 plus 1 is 1, and then this one may sound a bit weird to begin with, we're going to go for 1 plus 1 is equal to 0, because 1 plus 1, what is it, 2? Fantastic, but how do you write 2 in binary? 1, 0, but we don't see that one there, so we're going to see the 0 and then carry the 1. You're going to see this working now. So I'm going to add together 0, 1, 0, 1, 
and I'm also going to add 0, 0, 1, 1. So I'm going to add these numbers together. So 1 plus 1 is 0. So I'm going to carry the 1 over. So I can see that it's worth 2, but I've got my 2 represented there, so I'm seeing a 0 there. So I've got 0 plus 1 plus 1. Again, that's going to give me another 0, because I'm going to carry the 1 over. We've got 1 plus 0 plus 1, which again is going to be a 0, so I'm going to carry the 1 over. 0 plus 0 plus 1 is, of course, 1. Because we've got here, if we put these at the top, just to double check it afterwards, we've got 5 plus 3 is a and then what's this value here it's 8 if we have a look at another one so we're going to go 0 1 0 0 plus 0 1 0 0 0 is worth nothing that's worth nothing that is worth 0 carrying the 1 over 0 plus 0 plus 1 is 1 so again if we're looking at 8 4 2 1 4 plus 4 equals 8 where you can run into some difficulties, though, is if we are going to do this and we are going to add 7 and f um, 10. So I'm going to create 7, 0, 1, 1, 1. And then I'm going to create 10, which is going to be 1, 0, 1, 0. And this is where things can run into a problem quite significantly. 1 plus 0 is 1. Happy with that? Fantastic. 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. No problem so far, we're still working, this is good. 1 plus 0 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. This is where things are going to start to go wrong. 0 plus 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. But because this is a 4-bit number, we can't do that. This 1's over here, it's outside of it. This is what is called an overflow error. And what this means is that the data has gone out from a 4-bit number. And it's now trying to create a 5-bit number, but it can't handle it. So overflow error, this is how overflow errors occur. So if we're adding two 4-bit numbers together, the highest number we can create is 15, because that would be 1, 1, 1, 1. What we're trying to do here is adding together 7 plus 10 which is 17, which is greater than 15. So with 4-bit binary, you only, the highest number you can create is 15, but what we're going to look at now is 8-bit binary. The highest number you can create is 255. And that is if we go for 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8 plus 2 plus 1 equals 255. So that's the largest number you can create. So if you were trying to do... 64 plus 63 in binary, that's going to give you 127. So you can do that. If you're going to do 32 plus 32 plus 60, that is going to be equal to 122. You can do that. But if you're going to do 132 plus 132 plus 160, that's going to equal, why do I give myself hard numbers to work through? 100, 200, 300, 360, 364. That's going to give you 424, which you cannot do. With 8-bit binary, the highest you can go to is 255. Doing addition in 8-bit binary works exactly the same way as it does with 4-bit binary. Just with larger numbers, that's the only difference. So in your books, what I want you to do is add two 4-bit numbers together, describe what happens, add two 8-bit numbers together, describe what happens, explain what overflow errors are, why they occur, how they can be prevented. With that last one, I want you to do a little bit of research, add that in there. So give the video a quick pause, and then we're going to get cracking again. So now what we're going to do is have a look at character sets. And strangely enough, character sets are sets of numbers. There are two main character sets you guys need to know about, which is ASCII and Unicode. With ASCII, that uses 8 bits, which means the largest amount of characters you can get, 255, whereas Unicode, you can get 4 million plus. So if I was going to be writing this in a Japanese language font, these are English letters, I wouldn't be able to get it because the A in ASCII stands for American. 
So if you're looking at American writing or English writing, you'd be able to see that and use that with an ASCII. Whereas if we were French and this was in a French presentation, we wouldn't be able to see it because that we'd need Unicode. If we're going to be using emojis as well, emojis are all around because of Unicode. And again, why is binary used to represent characters? If we think back to the beginning of the presentation, binary is one or zero, which is something if it's on or off. And that's looking at the voltage inside the computer. So we can have 1010, which is worth 10, which then might, for example, mean some sort of control code. Or we could have the number 68, which might be worth a lowercase a, but we've only got a certain number of letters to play with. So what I want you to do now, do a little bit of research, and find out more advantages and disadvantages of ASCII Unicode, what are ASCII and Unicode, when did they come about, how did they come about, and why binary is used for to represent characters. We've looked about that, we can do this. Give the video a quick pause, and then we're gonna look at image representation. So now we're going to look at image representation. First of all, how is an image represented as a series of pixels? And all I'm going to do now is I'm just going to draw a lovely grid. And imagine that this is going to be a picture. How is the picture created and represented on a, pic on a PC? It's by if pic particular pixels are colored in or not colored in. So I'm just creating a little doodle here. And we can see the cells, uh, sorry, the pixels which are left white are that, the ones which are red, are red. So we can see here that we've only actually got an image with one, two, three, four, five, six pixels in, which are white, everything else is red. So images, if you go down to the basic level, are pixel, made up of pixels, and those pixels are particular colors. Metadata is important information that gets associated with your phone. So for example, if you were to take a picture, it would have the date, the time, the file name, I forgot to put an I on that, the file name, it could have the location, it could have the resolution it was taking in, it could have the DPI of the file, it could have if there's a focus on there, if there's a zoom on there. So all this useful information is metadata which gets attached to the file when it gets created. If we're thinking about color depth and resolution, the more colors you've got, so at the moment here, we've only got two colors. So if each value is either one or zero, we're using one, two, three, four, five, six times four. So that image there would be 32 bits because it's only recording if it's one or zero. If each one of these um, could be 10 colors, instead of having 32 bits, we're gonna need 320 bits. If we're gonna have a thousand, we would need 3,200 bits or 3.2 kilobytes. So the more colors you've got, the larger the file size. The resolution, I'm going to let you research that one because I'm feeling a bit cheeky. So guess what you're going to do now? I want you to be talking about how images are made up of pixels, what metadata is, why it's important, and different examples as well. Feel free to go back and have a look-ski. And what is the effect of color depth and resolution on the file size? That last bit there for resolution, you're going to have to do a little bit of research. So, we're now going to look at some sound representation, and I've stolen this lovely PC picture here from the BBC website in the bite size section. We have got information here, or rather um, air waves, air pressure hitting the microphone. So at the moment, I'm talking to a microphone, and it is measuring changes in air pressure. What then happens is the microphone translates this pressure into electrical voltage. So if it, instead of the waves coming in, it's then going to translate it essentially into ones or zeros, which then gets fed into an ADC which digitizes it and then we see it displayed on a screen. So that's how sound is sampled. So that's how the information gets from where you're speaking in the big wide world into a microphone and appear on the PC. There are sample size, bit rate, sorry that's a bad spelling mistake there, bit rate and sampling frequency. These are three impacts on the quality of the audio and that's something that you need to research because guess what? I want you to write down how sound is sampled. Sorry for the spelling mistake there again. And I want you to write down what impact sample, what impacts sample size, bit rate, and sampling frequency have on both the quality of the audio file and the file size of the audio file. And if we think back to where we're looking previously at images, if we're increasing things, we're probably going to impact the file size by making it larger. But I'm going to let you look into that. 
So the last section we're going to be looking at is compression. Compression is making things smaller. So if I've got a big file full of information, what I can do with compression is make that file take up a much smaller space, which is fantastic. If I've got a website and I want to download a file from it, would I rather have something which is 30 megabytes to download or 3 megabytes or even three kilobytes. So compression is all about making things smaller. If you're downloading something or if you're trying to put something onto storage, you want to use as little storage as possible. We've got two different types of compression, lossy and lossless. And I'll draw you a couple of pictures. For lossy compression, if this is the original size, and I'm just going to draw the original size image again for here. So if we're looking at lossy and lossless, with lossy compression, it deletes bits of information from the file. So when it's compressed, it's smaller. With lossless, it doesn't delete the information, but it stores it and retains some of it. So although it's not as compressed as loss as lossy, when lossy is uncompressed, I'm still missing some of the file. Whereas when lossless is uncompressed, I've still got the same size file. So with lossy it removes slash deletes uh, some of the information in order to compress it more whereas lossless doesn't so we've looked at compression lossy and lossless compression here so finally last activity for you then you can crack on with whatever you were doing in activity 7 I want you to be talking about what compression is why it's needed what is lossless lossy do some research when the different types of compression should be used and why get some real life examples in there so i hope this has been a bit hopeful for you i hope you've enjoyed it and i shall see you in another video see you later